Welcome to Lunch of the Lord. I'm Pastor Mark, and we're in Esther. We're going to be starting Chapter 8 this lesson. But before we begin, our theme verse for Lunch of the Lord, Jeremiah 15, verse 16, Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Now, <clears throat> as we start verse 8, Haman now has been taken back to his house. He has been uh, hanged upon the, the gallows that were prepared for uh, Mordecai. And, and uh, uh, so now we start in verse 8. And it says, On that day, uh, the king, Ahasuerus, gave the house of Haman, the, king, uh, the Jews' enemy, unto Esther, the queen. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told her, had told what he was to her. And the king took off his ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it unto Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. Now in verses 1 and 2, we see Mordecai is set over Haman's house. Now in verse 1, in those days, when a person was executed, all their possessions became the property of the crown or of the government, all right? So that the king could do with those possessions whatever he wanted to. Now, King Ahasuerus decided to give, to give all of Haman's possessions unto Esther. Now, Haman told those who Haman told those who killed the Jews that they could take the Jews' possessions for a prey. We see that in chapter 3 and verse 13. Right? If you all of those when when he wrote in the letters that were sent out to the provinces, you can kill the Jews and whatever they have in their house, you can take it for a prey, right? And now, now it is Haman's possessions which are being given for a prey. In verse 2, <clears throat> we see where, uh, she, uh, where Esther explains to the king her relationship to Mordecai. So after she explains how she's related to Mordecai, the king then gives Mordecai his ring of authority. It was on Haman's hand, but before they killed him, after they covered his head, and before they hanged him, I'm sure they removed things from, from Haman that belonged to the king. And the king got that ring back, and now he's giving it to Mordecai, the ring of authority. Mordecai is now able to make decisions and do business in the king's name and to take some pressure off of the king, right? So he's able to act and, and speak and do things for the king to take some, take some of the weight off of the king's shoulders. And it says that Esther was set over the house of Haman. It wouldn't have been right for Esther to give, to give away what, what the king had given to her, right? King Ahasuerus gave Esther Haman's house and his possessions, not, not the family, obviously, not the, the wife and the kids, but, but the possessions, the house and the possessions in the house. So what she did, so and, and it wouldn't be right for her to just give that away to someone else. It wouldn't be right. So what she did was to make Mordecai the ruler of Haman's possessions, while she, Esther, remained the owner of the possessions. So the king made Esther the owner of Haman's possessions, and the queen, she went, <laughs> she made Mordecai kind of like the, you know, the, the uh, how can I say, like, like a ruler uh, of the possessions, like under her. We do not know if Mordecai lived, actually went and lived in Haman's house. But Haman's family was not living there anymore. 
all right? Haman's family was not there anymore. Uh, so, but we don't know if, if, if Mordecai went and actually lived in, in Haman's house. We don't know. More than likely, I would say he didn't because, uh, because of the idea that, remember, uh, well, you'll see here in later part where, where the, the Jews had the right to uh, kill any of their enemies but it was also written don't you know don't take the don't take the spoils just leave the spoils just you know people come and whatever you have a right to defend yourself and kill your enemies but take your hand don't leave your hands off the spoil so if that was the attitude my guess is Haman, um, uh, Mordecai didn't live in Haman's house but anyways now verses 3 through 6 Verses 3 through 6 deal with Esther's position, uh, petitions. Uh, she petitions the king for a, uh, the second time now. All right, She goes to the king and she's making another petition to the king. So, verse 3 says, And Esther spake yet again before the king, and she fell down at his feet, and she besought him with tears to put away the mischief of Haman the Agagite and his device that he had devised against the Jews. Then the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king and said, If it please the king, and if I have found favor in your sight, and the things seem right before the king, and I be pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to reverse the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, which he wrote to destroy the kings, the Jews, which are in all the king's provinces. For how can I endure to see the evil that, that shall come unto my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? So in verse 3, Although Esther and Mordecai are pretty much protected now, yet the rest of the Jews are still facing the king's decree. You have to understand that. Just because Haman is dead and now Mordecai is put in a position of authority does not nullify the decree that the, that the king made under Haman. Uh, and so that decree is still standing, all right? And there are those in the provinces who still desire the, the death of the Jews, all right? So the decree of the king is still in effect, and there are people in the provinces that want to kill the Jews. So they have to do something here. And then we see in verses 4 and 5, the king held out the golden scepter towards the towards Esther, right? So it seems that Esther again approaches the king uninvited. And again, she receives favor from the king to approach and to make her request. So this is the second time that, that, it, that this happens, right? Now, in verse 5, in verse 5, she carefully, she carefully places all the blame on Haman. All right. Even though we know that the king was an accessory, right? She she carefully puts the blame on Haman, and she doesn't mention the king's part in this in this situation with killing the Jews. And when and when she says to destroy the Jews, which are in all the king's provinces she makes it sound as if the king will be hurt by this, right? So what she, she's very delicately going to the king. And she said, let's read verse 5. And it says, and said, if it please the king, if I have found favor in the sight of the thing, you know, uh, this thing seemed right to the king and I have been pleasing his eyes, let it be written to reverse, reverse the letters devised by who? By Haman right? The son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, right? And it says that, it says, which he wrote, which he wrote, but it wasn't really so much him. It was the, it was the king's authority also. 
so which he wrote to destroy the Jews which are in all the king's provinces. So she's kind of very, very uh, delicately uh, putting the blame on Haman and she's, she's letting the king know that if he doesn't do something here, the king is going to get hurt because thousands and thousands of people in his provinces are going to be killed. They're going to be killed, and it's going to weaken his, his, his nation. Verse 6, For how can I endure to see the evil that shall come upon my people, and how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? Right? So, Haman is dead, but his work is still in effect, right? His work is still in effect. The king's first letters cannot be stopped or reversed. That's what it says in chapter 8, in chapter 8 and verse 18. We're going to see that. Uh, they, they, it cannot be reversed. So how will God save his people? How is God going to save the, the Jewish nation if the king's decree under Haman cannot be reversed. All right. Now, uh, we're going to start in verse 17. I'm sorry, verse 7. Verses 7 to 14 deals with the king's decree of reversal. All right. The king's decree of reversal. And we'll get into, we'll start verse 7 here. And it says, Then the king Ahasuerus, said unto Esther the queen, and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and him they have hanged upon the gallows, because he laid his hands upon the Jews. Write ye also for the Jews, as, as it likes you, in the king's name, and seal it with the king's ring, for it is written, it, it is for the writing which is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring, may no man reverse. Right. So it's chapter eight, verse eight. I think I think I said eighteen. It's verse eight. All right. In verse eight, he says what? In the last part of verse eight, he says, uh, "And sealed with the king, may no, when it when it, when a writing is written, and it's sealed with the king's seal, it cannot be reversed." The king admits, I can't reverse what I wrote concerning what Haman wanted me to do. I can't reverse it. All right. But he's telling them uh, in verse 7, King Ahasuerus tells of all that he did to help the Jews. Right. He says, he says, Haman is hanged. Right. And Haman's property is given to Esther. And in verse 8, the king gives Esther and Mordecai the opportunity to do what they can for the Jews by sending out letters so that the Jews can defend themselves. The king could not recall nor reverse Haman's letters. So he says, instead of, instead of I can't reverse my letters, but what you can do is you two, hey, uh, Mordecai and, and Esther, you two can write letters that will counteract the first letter. You know, this brings up a thought. You know, words, words that we speak cannot be recalled. Things that, things that we have done cannot be undone. Hearts that we have pierced with our anger or judgment or pride they cannot be soon healed the influence that our actions and that our words have on people can last a long time 20 30 40 years later people will remember what you said or what you did and you can never erase it from their memory it's like writing words on a mirror with a diamond you can't they can't be wiped away things that we've said or done to people we have to be careful because as the king's letter 
could not be reversed. So there's things that we say to people, things that we do to people in anger or, or frustration or jealousy or pride, and, and you can't take it back. You just can't do it. We have to be careful. In Psalm 141, verse 3, it says, Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. And in Proverbs 4.23, it says, Keep your heart with all diligence, because out of it are the issues of life. If we love our neighbor as ourselves, then we won't have any worries about leaving bad impressions on people's hearts. And that's so true. We have to be careful what we say to people. I'm sure you remember things that people said to you years ago or, or something, one quick statement that they said that hurt you or offended you, and you remember that. And, and, and we, we have to be careful as Christians, put a watch over our mouth and uh, over the things that we do. Uh, because because these impressions will last for many years, and it may be the last thing they remember of you. We're going to continue on in, in verse 9 next lesson. But until then, walk with the Lord. I know he walks with you.